Three, two, one. We are live. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Inside Enduro Podcast with me, your host, James Stearns. We're brought to you by Inside Enduro. You can find us on Instagram at inside underscore enduro. Also on all the other platforms, iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, Spotify. And imagine if you're listening to us, you're watching us, you already found it. So great success. Good job on you. Today, we're going to change up do a little something different. I've got a special guest who's flown in from Gloucester, England. Obviously, for those who don't know, Europe, England specifically have a rich heritage in dirt biking, enduro, essentially motorcycling as we know it was conceived in the UK and England. So I bring to you our next guest, Scott Booth. In from the UK. How you doing, Scott? Good. Thanks for inviting me, James. Good stuff. Well, we've originally we started talking back in the day when we first met about TT and the Isle of Man. And for those of you who don't know what the Isle of Man is, Scott, you want to give us a little color on it? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so the the tourist trophy races really take place in a small island in between uh, the coastline of really England and out towards Ireland. Um, the race is sort of goes back now quite, quite some period of time, sort of pre-war, um, and the first evolution of bikes really is a road race. So the road race is conducted over 37.7 miles around the, the periphery, really, of the island. And that's over a, a course that is really road, roads consisting of um, curbstones, roundabouts, trees, hedges, stone walls. And the idea literally is to get around the course as quickly as you possibly can um, with all these hazards there so as best as can be um, made safe it is but to be honest with you it's pretty brutal yeah I, I just I think I saw a thing on it just recently that so far 136 or 138 people who've lost their lives attempting to race this race so I would yeah. believe it's fair to say that it's fairly dangerous yeah, I mean, it's um, it's unusual in a sense that it hasn't been banned or stopped already. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and really, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a testament really to the race that it continues. I mean, um, without a shadow of a doubt, every year there's a loss of, of riders. Um, but the, the unusual every, thing... Every year. Every year, there's, a, there's generally a loss of, of, right. of so riders. I gotta, so I got I to ask, and, and this is mm. part of the reason why we've done this podcast is I wanted to show some color on uh, just a little more a worldwide view, intestinal fortitude, toughness, perseverance, and, and particularly like yourself. I mean, this is coming from the perspective, you're a 10 year veteran of the Royal Marine Commandos. You've seen a lot of stuff. You've been, your father was into bikes, you're into bikes. So this is coming from someone with definitely a passion and a love and, and kind of a grit. So coming back to the TT and the Isle of Man, so everybody knows that a few, if not more, lose their lives every year trying to race this race around the island. So why do they keep stepping up? <laughs> For that whole reason that is dangerous and because it's pushing you to the the, the physical limits as well as the... Um, the professional limits of riding a motorcycle and I think you know me purely as a spectator I've done some amateur racing in my time um, but these guys and girls as well they take it to a whole different level in terms of their commitment and passion when people are riding past stone walls at 130 miles an hour and brushing their elbows on them you know that it's real and um, you know you're alive and the only way I can really describe it to you is the first time that I went to the TT um, as a spectator I wasn't quite sure what to expect. It's a thing of legend, but being stood at the side of a road behind a, a stone wall in a, in a churchyard, really, you can hear from a distance the, the, the distant whine of the engines coming, and you can hear them coming, and you can hear them coming. And then the next thing you know that you're looking down the road, which is a single carriageway, you know, one road, uh, one, one road to take you one way, and the opposite way, you've got traffic coming, curbstones, lampposts, signs, everything there. And then suddenly you have three or four bikes come past you at 
150 mile an hour plus and the air is sucked out of your lungs it feels like James, you're a big guy. You're punching me in the chest. That's what it feels like. It takes it takes the air really out of your lungs. And I cannot describe it. It feels like you've been punched in the solar plexus because these bikes rip by at such speed. You just can't comprehend it. And then the beauty of it is then as a spectator is once the racing finishes, you can go and do it yourself. But I think in answer to your question, why do people do it? Because they want to push themselves to the pure limitations of their riding capability and capacity to be the best, to do the most dangerous road race in the world, knowing full well that there is no coming back if you hit that wall. Yeah, I mean, I've seen various YouTube clips where these guys are going so fast and whether they manhole cover or an odd bit of pavement, because like you said, it's around the island and they do their best to shut it down as far as traffic, but it's still somewhat uncontrolled from a sheep, a dog, uh, some inadvertent person walking across the road when a motorcycle is coming. Literally, you see them come over a rise where they catch air for 100 feet, not high length, going 130 miles an hour. There's a, There's not a lot of room for error absolutely not and often actually you know when you're watching it or you're riding it and you're riding at those kinds of uh speeds the the time to be able to react i mean you train yourself into the course like we all do we'll be familiar with particular routes and we'll be used to what we're looking for the line that we have to take but of course the only thing that you can't um you can't really uh, foresee is if somebody in front of you uh, is coming off and at those kinds of speeds there's no reaction time so if a bike is disintegrating in front of your eyes you you don't know which way to go because there could be all there could be debris from fairings there could be rider uh, in your, the middle of the track so the the ability to make a decision at that kind of speed is well it's kind of out of your control really you kind of have to just pray a little bit and hope that you're going to take the right line because there's very little reaction time but you're right it's it's um you can you can know a course and you can know it perfectly well but you can't take out all the factors of uh being in open open land as you say where wildlife could actually walk in out in front of you quite realistically you can control things like the traffic but but not all those other elements. You know, if it's a wet day, if it's a bit damp on the ground, it just takes a little bit of a skit to throw you out, um, and it's enough to upset your whole day or even your whole year. Oh, man. I remember watching a video where one of the more infamous racers, the guy had completed multiple times. I think he, he had some wins as well. And he was at one of those 150, 160 mile an hour straightaways. And yeah. they had an aerial view of him. And his rear rim just exploded yeah. with the speed. Yeah. And at 150, 160 miles an hour, that's all she wrote. Yeah. It was over. Yeah. And there's a few, uh, there's a few um, interesting uh, anecdotes really from the TT like that. I, I've got a good friend of mine back in the UK. He used to work for Arai Helmets. And uh, he actually used to um, uh, pit crew for Joey Dunlop. Um, and so when Joey used to come in for his pit stops to fuel up, uh, Dave would um, service the helmet by cleaning the visor, ripping the tear off, off, et cetera, et cetera. But Joey's brother, Robert, who sadly has passed away as well. And that's exactly what happened to him. Actually, when they did the tire change, the, the, the mechanic putting in the new wheel in the back actually put it around the wrong way. Can you believe that? And actually, it blew the rim apart, and Robert ended up in a bad way. So did they fire that guy? Actually, Robert insisted that he was there for every race ever after because he knew that he'd never make the same mistake again. Ooh, but pretty a, scary. What a mortal mistake. Yeah. And I think I saw a documentary on the Dunlop family, and I believe it was they're one of the most winning TT families. The two oldest brothers have died yep. in the TT and then their sons yep. are now racing it. 
That's right. So Michael won last year, uh, the senior. So it's uh, it really is a family passion for those guys. And uh, to see them through the 70s and 80s with Joey and Robert, these guys used to literally be in the back of their van with the, the bikes and they would spanner and they would do all the mechanics themselves. In fact, Joey insisted on doing it. Plenty of pictures of him there with a cigarette in his mouth, uh, you know, smoking and, <laughs> English, and covered in oil. English Ab- style. Absolutely right. And you know what? There's, uh, there's some fa- in fact, I think it was Joey actually that drilled holes into uh, into his helmet so that he could push a cigarette through and smoke it while he's on the start line, believe it or not. That's probably true. But um, yeah, these guys, uh, a generation, a dynasty, and they're, they're beloved, certainly globally, not just in the UK, but they're well known for... That they're absolute all like passion for uh, for motorcycles. Wow, it's definitely crazy, and you see that commitment and wow, man, that's stiff, yeah. stiff, stiff. Just the description of the bikes coming back, and I think it's somewhat, definitely more confined with NASCAR when the NASCARs come around at two hundred miles an hour. There's yeah. obviously some turbulence, but this is is much more wild. Yeah. There's no roll cages. There's no There's nothing. fire crews. Yeah. These guys, uh, it's interesting. Again, some of the most famous riders of the TT, multiple wins over multiple years, um, come to a sticky end. Unfortunately, they can know these courses and they can be the winners for years on end, but sometimes it just doesn't work out their way some years. And, um, you know, Dave Jeffries was a, a fantastic racer um, and multiple TT course winner. And one particular year, he just it just didn't work out right. And literally, he wrapped himself around a lamppost, and, and that was the end of it. Um, so these guys are phenomenally experienced and brave individuals. Um, but sometimes the day just ends up wrong, but there's no comeback, unfortunately. That's not the place where you want the day to end up wrong. Absolutely not. You'd rather be on the podium. Well, shoot. And then I've also heard, is this true, most... I believe over the time span of the race with 130 to 140 riders who've passed away, a lot of them are actually the spectators that ride the course. Actually, the predominant amount are the spectators who bring their bikes over and are allowed to race or ride slash informally race the course. Yeah. It's true. I mean, one of the the major attractions about the TT actually as a spectator is the fact that you can ride the entire course. So the the main event will take place on a day and the roads will be closed off. So you can only ride uh, in the internal part of the circuit or roads that were safe to ride and they're marshaled pretty well. But as soon as the race finishes, um, there is the ability to be able to go and ride the course yourself as a just as a, a, a motorcyclist. So um, the only restriction to it is as you go through villages or towns that you have to abide by the law. So in the UK, normally riding through uh, a town can really be 20 to 30 miles an hour. But as soon as you reach the, um, the exit point of the village or the town, you can basically ride whatever speed that you like. Um, and most people generally give it a good bash, if I'm honest. Uh, there's, a, <laughs> there's, there's a pretty infamous section called the mountain section, um, which is about 10 miles. Um, a very picturesque mountain sort of scenery is very twisty as a few sort of switchbacks and the like, but it is full on. Um, often this is where most people will come or get caught out. And uh, you get riders literally from all over Europe, but all over the world. So they may hire bikes. Most people ride their own, but they'll come from Germany, um, you know, Southern Europe, anywhere to come to these races to have the opportunity to do so. So uh, a famous incident, well, I was over there in 2012, uh, 2012 was um, riding over the mountain course and actually being stopped. And what had happened is there was a, a German uh, motorcyclist had gone over the mountain course and then decided to come back over the mountain course. It was only one way. So he's coming back against guys and girls doing 100 plus miles an hour. And ultimately, he took out another rider with a pillion on, and it killed all three of them instantaneously. So uh, that year, I think there was about 12, 12 killed that year, riders and also spectators. Um, so it's, 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 it's a sad fact, and it's commonplace, but, um, you know, it's... Uh, Again, it's all part of the draw of going to the Isle of Man to be able to do what you can never, ever do on the open road normally. So 
on your lap, obviously three people dying simultaneously. That was fairly fatal. Do you get any, do you get squirrely at all on your, uh, it, it, <laughs> I mean, where's your adrenaline? You get yeah, on, you get I mean, on the you, thing and... You're and, on it. You know, the funny thing, James, is that you think that you are Valentino Rossi or whoever your personal sort of road or MotoGP type star is. You know, you're in your head, you think you're going like you are something particularly special. And then the next guy comes flying past you like you're going in reverse. Um, but you're always on it and to, you know, it's to know your limitations, I think. That's the... It is the key. I always say, don't mix up your intentions with your capabilities. And if if you've got a bit of that in your mind, you're okay. But often the red cake comes out and you think you're Superman anyway. But in answer to your question, of course, we all have that mortality. But then we think, you know, I'm not that stupid to make that same mistake anyway. Yeah, man, I don't know. It goes along with you're only as fast as you are. Exactly right. And as soon as you start to push over that, yeah, you're in a pivotal zone. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Well, that's crazy. And the way you talk about it, obviously, folks, this is going on today, currently. This still goes on, and it's still racking up fatalities, and it's it's amazing that it's still let to run and uh, yeah. let people have a go at it. But I think it, it kind of illustrates the rich history of the UK's motorcycling in the original in the beginning of the enduro days, the Royal Enfields, Nortons, Triumphs, or enduro bikes, and the Penton engines, and all that kind, all that kind of stuff. Um, you said your father was into bikes, so you were when you were young. So obviously, yeah. it, it just kind of transferred. Yeah, into, absolutely. Into your psyche. You know, I was uh, I was brought up really with my dad riding bikes predominantly to get to work. Um, so, you know, uh, old four-cylinder Kawasaki's and uh, bits and pieces, but also looking at black and white pictures of him in the heyday in the sort of, uh, you know, early 60s and riding Velocets and all the kind of good stuff, the traditional British stuff that we'd say that's now worth an absolute fortune and he will forever say to me, I wish I kept that bike. It'd be worth a fortune. So what, what was a Valisette? Yeah, what, so what type of a Valisette was an old sort of, you can imagine um, the Marlon Brando type early retro bikes, you know, uh, had a big fishtail exhaust on the back and uh, all the good stuff. So, you know, those things are worth a fortune now, uh, probably thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000, but difficult to find. And, and he will tell me the story of going down a country lane uh, after going to uh, a date, shall we say, in an American term, he would say courting, but a date, but riding back through the lanes, thinking he was great with his Marlon Brando jacket on and his boots <laughs> and his socks tucked over the top and, and a badger literally coming out in the middle of the road. And, um, the, you know, his nose went straight into the spokes of the bike and uh, threw my dad off and broke his leg. But more importantly, destroyed the bike. So my dad was pretty, uh, pretty upset about that. Badgers. Yeah, didn't matter about the leg. The damn bike was broke. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So then you've kind of you've kind of continued on as far as a bit of road bikes. You got your you got your certificate early. Yeah, and got to riding on them. And I think you've done some adventure bike riding as well. Yeah. So I think um, we all go through phases, and certainly in the UK, uh, you know, I'm I'm sort of mid forties now, but in the late eighties, early sort of nineties. It was all about the super sports bike. So um, there was always the fascination with that. And for me particularly, it was around Kawasaki's and ZXR's and the green machines. And uh, I sort of went from those early bikes into then moving towards um, V-Twins and Ducati specifically uh, and really enjoyed those bikes. So the, the majority of my um, pedigree really has been sports bike riding. But I got to a point actually about three years ago where... Actually, the realities of riding on the road are becoming very different in the UK now in terms of challenges with speeding and uh, all those kinds of things. So I was looking for something that was going to reignite my passion again for riding and um, spending a bit of time with yourself, actually, James, and sort of watching what you're doing with the enduro stuff has been really quite interesting. 
probably not enough time for me to be able to do it, um, realities of work. But what I did want to do is find some kind of happy medium. So I got involved really with starting to ride a few BMWs, the GSs, the bigger bikes, the more um, long way round kind of stuff that you'll be familiar with, yeah. uh, with Charlie and uh, Ewan McGregor. Um, but I didn't really want to be the guy that had a nice bike in the garage and it looked great and you went back and forth down a motorway. I wanted to kind of make, use it for what it was made for really and do some real off-road stuff. Yeah. So adventure adventure that's it that's it looking for something different so i wanted to throw a tent on the back i wanted to go and really get into the fields and uh, the hills and and do a bit more exploring so i, I really took a bit of a, a two-year pathway in learning how to ride properly because riding as you know off-road is a whole lot different to riding on-road and right. uh, i had to start all over again but it, it just became uh a, a real passion actually and once you get involved in it and you you start to understand the ca capabilities of these bikes even given the mass weight of a gs versus something that you know you're riding um is quite staggering really and amazing so it opened up a whole new uh lease of life in terms of my biking career really so i went on to uh do quite a few courses with bmw um, and that ultimately led to doing a few uh, a few competitions too, which were great fun. Fish on, fish on. Well, I know I've been kind of dangling the lighter two-stroke enduro lure. Yeah. And uh, I think you think you'll get closer. I mean, you've got such a rich pedigree coming from the UK with the likes, the OGs, David Knight, uh, yeah. Graham Jarvis, Paul Bolton, Johnny Walker. There's, uh, there's, there's no excuses. There's such <laughs> a, a rich, as you say, a rich array of guys and girls out there that are just, they're beyond uh, spectacular with what they can do in their capacity. I mean, it just, just amazes me really what people can actually achieve given the mindset and given the opportunity is, is, is staggering. Well, I think the UK does have does have a certain lineage and, and tough mindset, and that came into mind. We were discussing a bit of a story that started really interestingly. It was essentially you were kind of looking for a part of military memorabilia that was maybe going to become a coffee table, <laughs> and then it turned into uh, this anthropological yeah expedition that is open this really an amazing tale of of human fortitude uh perseverance and and just the mental toughness and i thought it was a great story and then especially when we start to look at whether it's the tt isle of man or the stresses of hard enduro or you also do a lot of triathlons yeah. where the training volume it takes it takes a certain mindset and it takes a certain focus and again that intestinal fortitude and as i started to listen to that story i was like man it's just it's just compelling so i know you were a big fan of the spitfire fighter planes of world war ii hmm. and I think the U.S. had their counterpart was the Mustang. That's right, yeah. And uh, so tell me a little bit about this coffee table you're looking oh, for. I know. I'll tell you. It's, <laughs> it's the longest coffee table story ever. It's the, but. it's the longest, biggest coffee table story ever. But it was, uh, it's a pretty good story. And thanks for asking, really. Um, so you're right. I, I've got a long passion with um, the Spitfire, uh, which is a, a Second World War fighter, as you quite rightly say, that was used by the Royal Air Force. Um, just because it, it was a, an ancestral thing, really. My grandfather was a design engineer, aeronautical design engineer for a company called Avros during the war period. And he was held back on a reserved occupation because of his involvement with the design of these aircraft. So um, there was always a big, a big pull for me in terms of that history. Uh, and I've always... I guess romanticized about that period of my grandfather's um, going through those those arduous and challenging years and uh, their tales of um, 
survival, whether it be my, my other grandfather in the Navy and, and, and be on a ship that was sunk or actually just on the home front and dealing with uh, the, the constant bombings and actually the challenges of living day to day with rationing, etc. So anyway, um, there was always this passion for aircraft given my grandfather's um, involvement and, and the Spitfire specifically. And um, one day, essentially what happened was, I, I, I don't know how it happened, even to this day, but I think I was on eBay looking for something and probably about 11 o'clock after a couple of beers and, and something <laughs> something popped up and you know you get those impulse buys, you know, Be- where you buy beer, something. Beer and eBay after 11 it's p.m. Terrible. is a, a recipe for disaster, disaster. With, <laughs> with PayPal. Absolutely. And then it's always about uh, asking for forgive- forgiveness rather than permission, right? Well, that's e- that's easier. Yeah, absolutely right. So um, anyway, long story short, I, I saw an advert for a, a, a a P-51 Mustang engine, um, as you've alluded to, that was the American equivalent of the, the Spitfire. And actually, in the later years, it was it was fitted with what they called the Packard Merlin engine. Uh, now, the Packard Merlin engine was a result of a collaboration between the Brits and the Americans, um, and really as a result of a necessity to get, get more engines for aircraft. And... Um, We couldn't produce enough units uh, in the UK because of the bombings and everything that was going on. So there was a look to subcontract uh, manufacture to the US um, to be be able to enable the the production of aircraft to, 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 um, to fight the Germans at the time. So uh, anyway, long story short, I saw this advert for a P-51 Mustang engine and I I couldn't believe it. I'd never seen one actively for sale ever. So I had to go and have a look and um, that's, that's what I did. So uh, essentially I went... And that that was my first question when you, when you told, when I got to this part of the story, I was like, all right, these are 12 cylinder monster engines. It's a big bit of kit. That have dropped out of the sky. I was like, Scott... What are you planning to do with this thing? <laughs> I had, uh, I, do you know what? I had absolutely no idea. All I knew is I had to go and see this thing because it was such a rare beast. It's like finding a Loch Ness monster, you know, a Sasquatch <laughs> or something. So I just had to go and have a look and touch it. You Why know? not? Yeah, I just had to go and touch it. I mean, you see them in museums, but that's as close as you get. So ownership was always way out of that control. But uh, so I had no idea in answer to your question, but I thought, you know, maybe I could turn that into a table or something. You know, my other half wouldn't mind, I'm sure. Uh, again, forgiving us and permission, two different things. But um, I took a drive up there and um, it was about an hour and a half, two hour drive to go and find this thing. And um, I met the owner uh, who was a nice chap. And he said, well, actually, I've got two other engines that you're welcome to have a look at. One's for sale, one isn't. So it was like finding a gold mine because suddenly there was two uh, engines that were there. UK pickers. UK pickers. And... Um, so he, he, he went and showed me another one of the engines was another P-51 Mustang engine. And um, the other one, he then unveiled it like it was Christmas. And it was a Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. So an original item um, that was smashed on the front end, having sort of been shot down in 1941. Um, but it was unmistakably a V-12 Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. Um, and it, it was just a fabulous thing to look at. And that would be a Spitfire. Well, this was um, this was the point: is that the provenance wasn't actually known at that time. It was just clearly uh, a Rolls Royce Merlin engine, um, and there was speculation that it was from a Spitfire, but not confirmation. Gotcha. Um, so the guy was reluctant to part with it because actually the parts for these engines are just rare. So what often happens is if you find them. Or if people find them, they want to break the engines to sell the parts because they're, they're, they're so expensive. Anyway, I couldn't let this guy break this engine. Um, so <laughs> after a, a, a bit of back and forth thing, I managed to persuade him somehow to sell the engine to me, which was, you know, it, it, it was priceless in, in the sense of whatever I paid, it didn't really matter. I got myself a Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. So and how do you get this thing home? Okay, so uh, I literally had to get it picked up on a on a on a truck. Uh, so I actually got a frame with it and um, got it mounted onto a frame with wheels, uh, so that we could just maneuver it because this thing weighs about six hundred kilograms. Um, so it's pretty hefty. That's over twelve hundred pounds, folks. Yeah. It's uh, <laughs> it's it's pretty heavy. So it had to come on the back of a lorry and uh, back of a truck, should I say, uh, and be dropped off to my house. 
curbside <laughs> and luckily the guy had a truck to push it up the drive because actually the drive is on an incline believe it or not so it's going to be a damn good workout wow yeah yeah all right so you get it home i get it home and then really that's where the story starts because um it was then trying to identify okay this is great this is a rolls royce merlin i i've just like this is like every christmas ever has come true for me as a, a brit this is you know the best thing that you can ever see so luckily for me the engine is stamped with numbers all over it which are consistent and um, i apply to the royal air force uh, for and rolls royce for information about the engine and um, eventually i get the information come back and it then transpires that Yes, um, it's a Rolls-Royce Merlin, and yes, it was fitted to a Spitfire aircraft because actually the the, the Rolls-Royce Merlin and Packard Merlins were fitted to a multiple of different aircraft. Mm -hmm. So it could be um, Spitfire to uh, Mustang to uh, Lancaster Bombers to Mosquito Bombers to Hurricanes. So a multitude, but really that if you, if you want to own one of these, uh, the best thing to ever have it come from is a Spitfire. And it was just lucky that this thing did. So that was phenomenal. I was, I was just beyond excited for that. And the Spitfires, were they the ones that they're somewhat famous for painting the faces of kind of like the shark or whatever on the cowling behind the prop. So that was um, that was more the P40s, which were uh, a British and American combination. But nose art, um, which you often see on the bombers and the fighters, was was a, an American thing, but was often adopted actually into the Air Force after. I mean, you know, us guys stiff up a lip and all that, but actually they quite like that. <laughs> so uh, especially when it was naked girls. But um, yeah, why not have a shark or a naked girl on the I front know, of your that, plane when you're in looks, battle? Right. That looks so cool. All right. Let's not be modest hey man but uh, gonna be cool you gotta look cool you gotta look the business and um yeah so it was uh it was a pretty cool thing to to have this and um i sort of had to sort of push a bit further with the history then and i then found out that the uh the aircraft the spitfire actually came from a, a squadron called 303 squadron um which was the most famous fighter squadron of the Royal Air Force during those war years for the fact that uh it was actually a polish squadron believe it or not and um, they had the highest enemy aircraft destroyed rate of the Battle of Britain. Um, and they become very famous for being very highly skilled pilots with very little uh, uh, concern about their own mortal being, really, having lost the majority of their family and friends in Poland during the invasion. So was that story, as I recall, is that essentially the Germans had taken over Poland and the fight was over and it was either if you wanted to continue to fight you moved off to England or another country to if you were a trained pilot or whether you're infantry to fight because if you stayed you're pretty much guaranteed to be executed yeah so it was um I think we're all aware of the the history. So in 1939, actually, the invasion of Poland was not just the Germans, it was the Russians too at that particular point. And um, the Polish put up a struggle. It wasn't a few days as often as thought. Actually, it was for probably about 40 days, which doesn't sound a lot. But actually, when you're a small country with two mighty forces coming through, it was a pretty staggering effort. So... The uh, the armed forces of Poland, whether it be the RAF or the Polish Air Force, should I say, or the armies, etc., um, did their very best. And as you say, they had a choice to either remain and keep the keep the fight going, or to really um, uh, escape and evade to continue the fight. But that was at the risk of leaving their family and friends behind and being uncertain of what their uh, their fate would be ultimately. Wow. So I guess that would definitely can shine light on the understanding of why these these gentlemen were just voracious fighters that they didn't they didn't know what the status was of their families whether they were alive or dead and yet they were still fighting the cause against their enemy enemy that had taken over their country so i would imagine would fight with reckless abandon Absolutely. And um, I think we would all, given that scenario, probably uh, like to think we'd do the same, but they, they had very little choice. Um, and it was interesting that um, on this discovery, of course, I knew the aircraft now. Um, but what I was able to do is identify the pilot um, 
uh, and the pilots of this particular aircraft by uh, accessing all the flight logs and every combat mission that it had flown. And it, it opened up a whole new thing. So this, this coffee table, this expensive <laughs> piece of metal that, that I had purchased has suddenly become so fascinating. It's got, it's, a, it's got a heartbeat now. Oh man, this thing is just unbelievable. It's, it's, it's a passion because the, the pilot story um, is amazing. So he, he actually transpired to be the commanding officer of one Polish fighter wing. So this guy was pretty important. And believe it or not, he, he was one of the oldest guys um, in the Polish Air Force of the escapees. And he was a mere 35. But at that age, he was almost twice the age of the other pilots that had escaped with him. So his experience was massive. Um, and he had actually escaped. He had led the bomber squadrons in Poland um, before the capitulation and then escaped through Romania into France, continued to fight with the French um, Air Force and fly the French planes until Dunkirk took place. Um, and then when Dunkirk took place, they were evacuated as a matter of priority to get pilots back to England to continue the fight in England because, of course, we were then expecting um, the German forces to come over the channel almost immediately on the back of Dunkirk when we were, we were at our weakest. So every pilot, irrespective of nationality, if they were willing to fight, um, we, we took them. <laughs> That's amazing. It's amazing. It's like the tide is coming and it doesn't matter what nationality you are. If you can fly, if you can fight, this is the, cause the next this step is the, is the Atlantic ocean. That's right. And, and you have to remember as well at this point in time, these poles were now experienced fighter pilots because they had been fighting for months and months in different countries, but against the same enemy. Uh, so they knew the tactics of um, the Germans uh, and what they also knew was how to handle the aircraft in such a way to be able to fight them effectively. But what they needed to do was to understand a whole new set of aircraft in the British aircraft that they had. And that was difficult because they didn't understand English necessarily. So learning the controls and the dials and, and, and all those kinds of things was difficult and perceived as a big problem by the British. So they were put really in a initially a training role until they were kind of caught, uh, one of the squadrons and one of the, the flights was caught on a mission, a training mission, just flying. And um, they saw a group of other RAF um, fighters in trouble um, whilst out and, and broke away from, from order, which is not a British thing to do, but the police didn't really <laughs> care. They sought the opportunity to actually seek some revenge and they just went for it. That's the no speakerly English. That's right, yeah, that's right, yeah. Repeat, please, as the film guns, says. Guns, guns, armed. That's right. So off they went and they engaged, actually, and they had, um, they, I think they destroyed several aircraft on that particular, uh, that particular sortie. They got down and um, they, they, they got told off within an inch of their lives as the British would do, you know, a stern talking to. But at the end of that particular bollocking, if you like, they were then told that they were then made combat effective. So they were they were pleased as punch and um, they become the most effective squadrons that the RAF actually had. Wow. Yeah, pretty amazing, right? It is. It is motivation. So it's um it, it was pretty cool. So I this this guy was the commanding officer and um I needed to know a little bit more about him and um, actually Facebook is a uh, good or a bad thing, whichever way you look at it, but it's got something for everybody. And um, I found a page that was dedicated to this squadron and the family and relatives and people just with a general interest. And that's the 303 squadron. 303 squadron, yeah. So I, um, I just put a post on there saying, hey, listen, I've got this engine. I've found a pilot. This is a few pictures. If anybody knows anything, just reach out. I'd be interested to know. And uh, within an hour, I had... Um, a response back and uh, this guy uh, had actually just finished writing a book about the Polish pilots involved in the Battle of Britain um, wow. which documented everything from their their you know their initial sort of early days in Poland through uh, you know into France and then into England and the formation of the squadrons and then the subsequent involvement in uh, the Battle of Britain at this particular juncture and what it included was a biography of each and every pilot involved 
um, which was unbelievable. It, it just gave you every detail about each pilot, what they did, if they'd shot any aircraft down, and, and one thing or another. And that's another. from researching because they all have flight logs. Flight logs and details, uh, you know, but this guy done a painstaking year's worth of job to put all this together. It's an amazing book. Um, but what he also said is, I've also, um, if you're interested, I've got a contact for your pilot's son. And at that point, my jaw nearly hit the floor. I must be honest. So that was pretty cool. So, and then I believe that pilot's wife and two children that were remaining in Poland, they had an interesting story that relates back to the son you found. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I reached out to um, the pilot's son, um, who's now in his 80s himself, and he was in Sydney, Australia, of all places. Wow. And um, that was pretty amazing. And I, I reached out to him via email, and uh, he subsequently responded and was just delighted to hear from me because he never actually realized that his father's aircraft had been found. And also, he, oh, wow. he just didn't know actually uh, definitively where his father was buried. No so joke. It was it was pretty enlightening for him. Wow. So when they left, when the family, what happened to the family that ended up? How did he end up in Australia? Yeah. So again, this is this 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 piece of scrap metal that I bought just turned into so many different avenues that were amazing in this feat of human endurance because. What happened is I spoke to to Jan, and um, he then really told me the story of what happened um, once his father had gone to to fight. So what happened is the Russians um, controlled the sector or the area that uh, the pilot's wife, uh, his mother, and them lived in, and essentially it was kind of comply or don't comply, uh, and and they were basically marched to Siberia literally marched to Siberia. So um, his mother had to carry him and his sister, who were toddlers, sort of under the age of four, literally in a Hessian sack to keep them warm from Poland to Siberia. Um, so a, a traumatic journey, but this woman did it, you know, not with comfortable shoes or comfortable clothing or anything particularly. It was just a survival exercise. Walking from Poland to Siberia with yeah. two children on your back in a sack. In a sack and, and no other possessions to go with it. And, you know, it it was, you, you kind of, you do it or you die type thing. So they were marched to Siberia. And then um, essentially the story from there is that uh, this initial sort of foray into Poland with the Germans and the Russians almost working together then span into a different scenario when the, the Germans invaded Russia. And then for the Russians to really gain... Uh, a um, foothold with the Allies. Uh, they had to release all the Poles was part of the conditions of the Allies then starting to help the Russians. So they did that. And um, at that point, again, the mother then had to walk from Siberia to find a neutral country to find some form of um, freedom, if you like. And essentially that journey took her and her children on a walk from Siberia to India. Um, which is <laughs> staggering. And it took two years, two years to walk there. To India. To India. So it, it, it's amazing, actually. I, I, uh, I, I bumped, well, I, I ended up meeting another guy. I didn't tell you this bit, but I ended up meeting another guy at a meeting with work in Israel. And he was there from New York. Um, and he was there as a, a consultant and talking uh, in a lecture. But I was talking about this story and he said, that's unbelievable. You know what? My grandmother was on that same journey to Siberia and she was then released in Siberia, but she walked to Israel. So people were walking everywhere, including his grandmother who walked to Israel and the the mother and the two children of this pilot walked to India. And then from India, subsequently, the British then transported them to Australia, which is where they, uh, which is where they stayed. And, and and why uh, Jan still resides in Sydney? Wow, what an incredible story! I mean, unbelievable walking across the world and a good book for anyone interested. The Long Walk is, yeah. I believe, they were still they were prisoners that had escaped yeah. and in the middle of winter walked from Siberia to India, which I believe they crossed the Himalayas. Yeah, and a couple made it. I think most of them of the group had died 
but two finally made it to a British envoy in India and were able to get, you know, repatriated and get back. But again, you know, you talk about human toughness and human resilience and and I think it gets lost in this age where you have no real realization how tough and how determined the potential of humans is. It's, it's staggering, isn't it? I think, you know, both you and I have um, been involved in many um, high levels of sport, whether it be rugby or, you know, uh, the enduro work that you do, me with sort of my military background and also um, triathlons, Ironman. We, we know what it's like to push ourselves hard. But really, that's taking yourself to a whole different level um, for a consistent long period of time. We're talking years, not days or hours. Um, yeah. And that ability to sort of push through no matter what is staggering. And, and like you say, it's um, th- this whole story for me was about a, an engine that, that I had an interest in, but that led to a whole new perspective on being human, really, because it led to so many different avenues of realization of how lucky we are today and maybe what we forgot we can actually do if we we put our minds to it and um it really is about a focus and that that will to succeed or to survive in this particular case because from the pilots who came from poland to fight in france to fight in britain their determination to survive and to see their uh their families um you know, live essentially in the, uh, and see Poland freed is where they were pushing themselves and there was no thought for themselves in the way they acted. And in fact, um, we talk about the the highest enemy aircraft uh, destroyed rate and that was for a reason. And, and it was because the British would tell you to engage or open fire about 200, 150 meters away from an aircraft. Well, these guys didn't want to waste a single round, a single bullet. So they waited till they were about 50, 25 meters away from an aircraft before they even opened fire so that they knew without doubt that the oh, enemy man. aircraft was going to go down. 50 meters, 50 yards in an airplane that's traveling, yeah. how fast? Well, these things would go up to 450 miles an hour. So, you know, Rockets. at that time it was, it was, it was staggering. And, A and, prop plane doing yeah. 450 miles an hour getting... 50 yards, 150 yep. feet from another moving object yep. before you drop the hammer. And often you have to remember that they were engaging, you know, bombers at that point in time. And these things were heavily armed. just Shooting like, back. Like so they were shooting back in every direction. And um, I told you the story earlier, James, of this determination point about humanity. And um, there's one particular pilot that uh, had flown the aircraft that, that I have the engine to. And um, in, a, in a mission that he was flying with, my spitfire shall we say uh, i'm gonna take that for yeah, with, that's with, my spitfire with my coffee table absolutely right um that uh he he actually was engaged um by enemy aircraft and uh, he managed to get behind the back of the first one and he, he took that one down he then got behind a second and took that down and then he had a third uh, enemy aircraft come behind him which he managed to avoid and get behind the back of and when he pressed the uh, the fire button on his control column, there were no rounds left. Uh, and then, oh in, shit! Yeah, and then ensued a dogfight actually for ten minutes of of trying to avoid being shot down by this this enemy aircraft, to the point that he did manage to get around to the back of it again. And um, rather than go home uh, and and potentially risk being shot down himself what he did is he tucked himself up as far as behind this enemy aircraft as he could and he actually cut the tail off of this plane with the propellers of his spitfire and uh, the enemy aircraft went down and he managed to limp it back literally glide it back to the coast of england just and crash landed it on the ground i think he broke his collarbone and got a bit concussed but six weeks later he was back flying again Holy crap. That's something, you know, you think you'd see from, you know, some cheesy movie like The Expendables or Fast yeah. and Furious that, hey, I'm out of bullets, yeah. so I'm going to use my prop to saw your ass end off and hope that you get the worst of it. Yeah, I mean, it's true. I mean, honestly, I've got the combat reports, official reports from the uh, the RAF, and, and it states that. And um, these things are always backed up. So uh, it's pretty interesting stuff. But that, that, that key to sort of that, that want and that need to survive, but also that uh, that desire to actually achieve what you've set out to do is amazing. That's a bad fucker. Yeah. <laughs> You're telling me these bulls. 
Oh, man. And it's interesting, even in the hard enduro world, particularly in Romaniacs and some of these races, you get the Russian Russian riders, Polish riders, you know, a lot of these Eastern European, and they're tough, man. Tough hombres, honestly. It's uh, tough. There's they, no, there's no quit in them. No, there's no, there's nothing left because you know. I think you get to that point where it's like, it, it's try or die, really, isn't it? You know. And um, I, I'm a firm believer in if if you turn up, you turn up. Otherwise, you just don't bother coming. And um, no matter where you're going to end up, you're going to finish. Um, and that's what I always believe in personally is that, you know, if you're going to turn up, at least have the commitment and the guts to go through it. To go all the way. Absolutely. Any half commitment. And, and certainly from a commando's point of view, that was something that was always instilled in me is in the UK, there's an advert um, that says 99.9% need not apply for the commandos. And um, that is the ethos. It, unless you're 100% committed, then you're not going forward because you'll never make it. Yeah, I think I think it's a great point, and you see it in military life. You see it in the hunting world, especially extreme backpacking, that type of thing. And then also, it's funny again, you know, as we all have this love of engines and motorcycles, and we do the enduro and dirt bikes and. It's interesting that you can see if somebody's hitting a big feature, you can see where people who have given up and failed before they hit it. Yeah. Like they, they don't realize it. And, and I've done it. I've done it myself. And it's a mental focus to not push the eject button prematurely and to Absolutely. stay tight and to stay focused and stay committed and see the feature, the ledge, whatever it is to see it through. Yeah. And it's interesting with our modern technology with someone you fail on something and you see a video and all of a sudden both feet have dismounted the foot pegs before you've even impacted. So yeah. the mind had given up yeah. before trying to even realize the success. And when you look at that, and I think that comes back to the commando thing, that's a different that's a difficult thing I think we all in life grapple with because you're faced with the decision that are you going to commit a hundred percent or are you not? And a lot of times people think they're committing and they don't. They yeah. start to eject, they they move, they start moving away, they don't even yeah. realize it. And with the video, it's interesting, you can see that and you can see that people are ejecting. Or usually if you have tough enough mates, friends yeah. that don't give any bullshit, they're yeah. looking back and they're going, dude, you yeah. started to eject and give up before you even hit it. Yeah. And so then one thing I have to tell myself is, and you almost have to rev yourself up for it, is listen, I'm sticking through it, sticking in it. Because typically what you have happens, if you don't commit 100%, it's it's a ninety five percent that you're gonna fail. Yeah, and if you know that conscientiously, hmm. then why would you do it without a hundred percent commitment? And then same Absolutely. thing, you get into commandos, military, where you have high stress situations where it matters. If you don't hit it at a hundred percent, there's there's no point. If if you know the alternative is is deadly or destructive or will cause injury. Absolutely. And I think often that um, it's that feeling, certainly, you know, when I do in uh, triathlon, Ironman training now, is that I'll get up and I'll be full of enthusiasm. And then I'll get about six to eight miles into a, a road run. And I'm thinking, I could turn around here. <laughs> I'm feeling tired now. I could turn, okay, it's easy. I'm just going to turn left here. Anyone for a cappuccino? That's right. Yeah. I could be home in a minute. Uh, 20 minutes. I could be home. I've got another 10 to go. And you know, it's at that point it's being able to, um, flick that switch and actually know it's like, you know what? Just commit and go. Um, and it's all too easy just to turn left, right and be home in 20 minutes, but that's not going to get you to where you need to be ultimately. And it's not even necessarily about being in first place. It's just about getting to that end goal and achieving what you set out to do. Um, so I think it's a firm commitment mentally. I mean, physically, we're all capable of doing stuff as long as we train. And that's all part of that commitment. But mental attitude, 
is is definitely a hundred percent of what uh, you're looking to achieve within the pro enduro scene and what I'm looking to achieve in in Ironman and, and triathlon and um, I think there's some lessons to learn of old really with what we've been talking about today it's a it's a very broad series of subjects we've talked about but ultimately it, it draws us back to human nature and what is required it's uh, like you say testicular fortitude is what <laughs> I call it and uh, finding your backbone when you need to find it there's no doubt there's no doubt it's so it's so important and again i think all of it comes back to especially when you look in the form of competition it's so easy to get focused on all the things around you all the variables other competitors whatever sport it is yeah but the true fight the true fight the day-to-day fight it's a fight against the resistance of yourself i couldn't agree more i think the fight that the, the the fine line is, as well, I would say, uh, certainly for me, is that being really quite a competitive person is that I've always got a game plan until I get to the start line. <laughs> <laughs> and then I see everybody else and I think, I've got you. I'm going to take you. And it's always having that goal and that someone in front and want to try and catch. And we had this very conversation yesterday, but that red mist comes down. But it's actually knowing how to temper yourself because you train yourself. You know what you're capable of and you're, you're capable of more, actually. But the reality is a race is long, irrespective of whether you're running a 100-meter sprint, whether you're doing a 60-mile enduro ride, whether you're doing a, uh, an Ironman competition. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It's a long race. And you just got to play your game that you've trained for because, as we said yesterday, that person in front, you're going to catch him up if you relax and you go into your natural style that you've trained for anyway. But you need to be prepared first. And that's all about that commitment and heart that you do seven days a week until you get to that competition point. Well, and that's, that's really all that you have. Absolutely. And you're not going to come out and perform at someone who you're not. Yeah. And the way I look at it, and we talk about it quite a bit, is almost the goal is is to run at, your own potential yeah your realized potential and a lot of times if you're focused on other people other things going on trying to catch someone because that could be someone who burns out in the first hour yeah and if you took the bait and you followed that yahoo you're right in the same boat yeah maybe you trained a little better and you're a little tougher and you make it 10 minutes further before you die but again you failed yourself Absolutely. because you didn't reach you didn't reach your potential. And again, that fight yeah. is with yourself. Yeah, I mean, it's just all about sort of finding that endurance point and and finding your own pace and your own rhythm. Um, and I think we all know where that is. It's not being suckered into something else. That's right. Because, like you say, is that 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 you may be great for ten minutes, but you know what? You've got to be good for an hour, whatever the time, the distance, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. You've got to last that course of time. So don't be suckered into that. Just um, be true to yourself. Oh, and it's easy. It's easy to take the bait. I've taken yep. a lot of bait. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Much to my failure. <laughs> yeah, it's brutal. And and you know when you're in the deep shit and. You're like, man, I really wish I wouldn't have, wouldn't have taken the bait. But for me, that's the hardest. That has been some of the hardest mental derived confidence is believing that your preparation and how you can perform just you, not what you dream about, how you dream about performing, but how you perform is good enough to put you where you want to be. Yeah. Because obviously anyone who's competitive always wants to win, Mm. but wanting to win isn't enough. You need to on the day exercise, hopefully realize your potential with maybe a certain percentage over your potential if everything goes okay. But again, that whole fight, everything is derived from yourself. Yeah. And I, I kind of look at it in a way it's almost like having a firewall in a car where you have the engine, you have the firewall, and you have the driving compartment. Or you have a partition on a computer. Yeah. And you got that engine, right? And the engine's great. That's where the fire, that's where you know the output is. And then you have the fuel, yeah. which let's call the fuel, you could look at that as calories, or you could look at the fuel as the emotion. Because mm. when you get in that, competitive zone it's hard not to look at the others and go hey listen i'm here to kick ass and you're in my way 
Yeah. And it's hard not to do that as a, as a human yeah. and especially as a competitor. And the way I like to describe it is the second you have the fuel or the emotion and you put it in the same compartment as the engine, hmm. this going to be trouble. You have a volatile situation. Absolutely. You got a problem. Yeah. So the trick is having the partition, having the firewall, having the engine and having some type of fuel line that is a safe distance to the emotion yeah. so that you, you can use the emotion as a catalyst, but it's governed to yeah. stay within your program, stay within your focus, stay within your style and give you that fuel to keep running at that highest level that's the closest or maybe even a little above your potential of what you've trained to at that point without going into the volatile where you pull the whole emotional tank, yeah, the whole thing into the engine compartment yeah. and you have the adrenaline dump and then burr. Yeah. You're yeah. hosed, man. You like you, you let agree. you let all you let it all go and now you're out. I think you're right. I think um, it is definitely uh, it's a training scenario for emotions, uh, for physical effort. And to coin a phrase from you, it's kind of, I guess, that firewall, that tank, that emotion. It's just knowing when to hit nitrous at the right point. Yeah. All right. We have that capability and we can do that. But it's knowing when to do that, um, because if you hit it and you, you, you blow your load in one go, then we're all done. Right. But we can use it effectively when we need to. Yeah. It's just knowing when to do it. The first 10 minutes is probably not advised. Absolutely not. But often that's where it goes. <laughs> <laughs> well, they say, man, like, you know, you can't, you, you can't win a race in the first 10 minutes, but you can certainly lose it. Absolutely right. hundred <laughs> percent. So, well, right on, man. Well, Hey, I just, you know, I thought it'd be a great opportunity having you on and, uh, gives us some UK flavor. Um, man, I always love the UK guys, you know, guys like Paul Bolton and, Johnny Walker, it's great seeing those guys, and Graham Jarvis. Obviously, we've got to spend some time with, and uh, I just think it's a, uh, you know, I always like the outlook, and the British definitely have their own their own outlook, and yeah, uh, for sure, I like it, man. I like it. It's uh, it gives color and flavor, and and there's a, yeah, there's a certain machismo about it. I like it, man. Uh, it's great. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to uh, to be involved, James, and uh, thanks for asking me. All right. Well, till next time, everybody. We hope you enjoyed it. little uh, history, but uh, I don't know. I think it dovetails into what we're all trying to get done every day because it's, again, it's human nature, human perseverance. Get out there and have some fun, boys. All right. Thanks, all. Thank you. Cool.